on and bless him. If you've made Jesus your choice and you're following after him with your whole heart, go ahead and honor him. Hallelujah. Give him glory. Hallelujah. We bless him. Oh, hallelujah. He's worthy. If I have a witness in the house this morning, then you know he's worthy. Give him honor. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. We bless him. We bless him. We bless him. That's all right. Yes. We bless the Lord. We give God glory and honor for another Sunday to be in his presence. I count it an honor and a privilege to be here with you today to bring you um, God's word. Yes, it's, sir. It's not my word. It's, it's God's word. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. I just want to be faithful in bringing what his word says and what he's speaking to me and what uh, he feels that we need for today. We're going to be taking a look at the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter at a, at a familiar passage to many of us. And uh, while I was preparing, God was uh, impressing on my heart to just share some things in this familiar passage that possibly we, we haven't considered or uh, taken a look at it in that particular light. I want to thank Minister Shields for reading the scripture for us today. God bless you. Looking at, jumping down at the seventh verse, John chapter four, starting at the seventh verse. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh meat, uh, drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And then in verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that is saith unto thee, Give me to drink, mm -hmm. thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Yeah. Amen. This morning I want you to pray me, with me on the topic of your relationship matters. Father, we thank you again for another opportunity to delve into your word. And Lord, I pray that you would open our ears and our, our hearts to hear what you have to say and we can feel what your spirit is drawing us closer to. Illumine us today by your word so we can live by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So in this familiar passage, and I just want to get right to it because there's a lot that I want to get through. But what we find here is an encounter with Jesus Christ with this woman of Samaria. And if you understand and, and done some study to understand why there was such animosity between the Samaritans and the Jews, you would understand that the Samaritans during an enemy occupation had intermarried with the, the, the oppressors of the time and they had offspring. And those offspring were we considered half Jew and half uh, of the enemy. So the Jews who felt like they were of pure blood looked down on those of Samaria in a way in such that they would call them half-breeds or, or anything less than a dog. So there was always this animosity from the Jews having a superior type of attitude towards the Samaritans who felt like, hey, we still have the same father in Abraham. We still have rights to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. We are human, just like you. When in opposition, the Jewish people would often look at them as you're not entitled to anything. Mm -hmm. So in this particular occasion, we find Jesus saying to the disciples, I must needs go through Samaria. Now, any self-respecting Jew of the time would go out of their way to avoid that city at all costs if they yeah, could. Yeah. But in the off chance that they had to go through it, it was very quickly. The, death, the dust could not settle on them. Right. Mm -hmm. 
But Jesus made this divine appointment. And please understand, Jesus was doing this on purpose. Mm -hmm. That's right. He was intentional in what he was doing. Yeah. And Jesus proclaimed to the disciples, I have to go to Samaria. Mm -hmm. And we'll find out why in a moment. So as we look at this, Jesus, he goes to the well, and it's not by mistake that he sent the disciples to buy me, to get provisions for the group. Because Jesus could understand how the interaction that he was going to have at this well with this just one woman, it could have been tainted by the disciples' hypocrisy, by their bigotry, by their bias. She might have been offended by seeing them and seeing them turning their noses up at, at her. And, and she could have completely shut down. But no, Jesus, yeah, yeah. he had an appointment to meet. So Jesus, he, he, he approaches this woman and he says, give me a drink. Now, it, it, to, to us today, if someone said that to us and we didn't know who they were, we, we could easily get offended because the language doesn't sound very appropriate. And, and in fact, it doesn't even, it's not even tagged on with a please behind it. Okay, but understanding the times, uh, you know, it was okay for a man to say to a woman to give me something to drink. And it wasn't uh, offensive, okay? So I don't want you to get any ideas behind that other than the fact that Jesus just politely asked her for a drink. And then in verse 9, it says, And he saith unto the, wo the woman of Samaritan. Now, follow this, understand. And again, remember, we're talking about relationships. And how they matter. Keep that in the back of your mind. Your mental Rolodex. But verse 9 he says. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him. Now this is what the woman replied. When he just simply asked for a drink. How is it that you being a Jew. Mark that in your mm -hmm. mental notes there. She called him a Jew. Asking of me for a drink. I'm a woman of Samaria. The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now, Jesus starts off saying, If you knew the gift of God, who is the gift of God? What is the gift of God? Think about that for a moment. If you knew the gift of God, to know something is to be in relationship with it. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong? Mm -hmm. my, my. For those of you who are married, you're married to your husband or your wife, you know them. Mm -hmm. He said, if you knew, Jesus is pointing to a relationship mm -hmm. that she does not have. Follow me. And who it is to say to thee, give me to drink. And he's talking about my identity. He's, he is the gift of God mm -hmm. incarnate. He is the gift of God in spirit. He is the gift of God in the fullness of the heavenly father. But if you knew, if you had a relationship. All right. Now, please understand, I'm not beating up the woman, but I just want you to understand where she's at. You would have asked of him. And he would have given you living water. The woman says in verse 11, the woman saith unto him, sir, mark that. First, she called him a Jew. Now she's calling him sir. All right. the sir, in the form, if you look at it in the original language, it's a, it's a form of respect. Or calling him master or lord or just mister. Your equivalent would be mister today. But she calls him sir. I call people sir. That's a sign of respect. Thou has nothing to draw with. So you ask me for a drink, but you don't have anything to, to drink with. And this well is deep. From whence hast thou living water? So she identifies a couple of things. He doesn't have anything to drink with. And then she says, the well is deep. And where is this living water going to come from? Now, immediately she went to the physical things. When all of long, Jesus was talking about spiritual things. Right. Yeah, yeah. Relationship. Mm -hmm. Relationship. She went to the physical things. The spiritual things went over her head. She missed it. 
Art thou greater? Now follow this in 12, verse 12. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus said, uh, and Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus pulls her back. He draws her back in. You went physical, but I'm going back to spiritual. There's something I need you to get. This encounter is not random. This is intentional. You just don't know it yet. Hallelujah. You just don't know it yet. Verse 15. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not. Now, Jesus gave her a spiritual concept. Amen? Talk to me. It's okay. Did Jesus give her a spiritual concept? Yes, he did. So in verse 15, and now this, this is a pivotal moment. I want you to get this. So the woman hears what Jesus says, and she replies by saying what? The woman saith unto him. Read it with me. The woman saith unto him, sir, give me this water. Now stop. That would have been fine if there was a period right there. Is that a period? It's a comma. Well, what else does she say? She said, give me this water that you're speaking of. But what does she say after that comma? That I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She went right back to the physical. Jesus presented her with a spiritual concept, but she missed it by going back to the physical. Give me what you're, what you're, what you're going to give me. I, I, I want it because I don't want to come back lugging these buckets to this well anymore. I'm tired of doing it, and I want to drink water that I don't get thirsty anymore. That sounds like a good deal, doesn't it? Sure, but that's not what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about a little bit more. He was talking about a deeper depth, and she wasn't getting it. And it's evidence in the next verse, 16. Jesus said unto her, go call thy husband and come hither. Now, I, I, I love this because Jesus had to shift gears. He says, okay. He, yes, amen, my sister. He's trying to help a sister out. Isn't that all right? Isn't that all right? Why? Because the comforter has come. All right. Yes, sir. This relationship, Jesus wasn't so quick to throw it away. In this relationship of misunderstanding, Jesus wasn't trying to run away from the, the tough conversation. He, he wasn't trying to turn his back on the fact that she didn't quite understand or get where he was coming from. But Jesus, he said, you know what? I got to change it up a little bit so you can really understand who I am and who it is that you're really talking to today. Jesus wasn't trying to be secretive. He wasn't trying to hide anything from her. He was just giving her some revelation knowledge. And if you understand from the beginning of the conversation, he went from just being just another bigoted Jew, but he, came, he became a gentleman in her presence. He didn't turn his nose up at her. He didn't look down at her and say, well, look at you, you dirty Samaritan woman. You look at you. He took time to invest in this encounter. So as he's revealing little nuggets of wisdom, she just wasn't quite there yet. She wasn't ready, but he wasn't giving up on her. Do I have somebody to send here as a witness that God did not give up on you when you messed up and when you were in your mess? Some of us just this week messed up and God didn't turn his back on us. Thank God for his grace and his mercy. It's new every morning. Why is it new every morning? Because you mess up daily. Yeah. Knowing or unknowing. 
This flesh is weak. We have power in the Holy Spirit to overcome, but heaven help us. So Jesus says, you know, in this moment, I have to, you know, just switch it up a little bit so you can get a little bit deeper understanding of who I really am. Because she, he said it from the beginning, if you knew who I was, you would have asked of me for something. But she didn't quite get it yet. So instead of him putting her down or getting frustrated, he says, you know what? Let's change the subject. Go get your husband. Now, th I love this part. In verse 17, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. She said it straight up. I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, thou hast said, uh, well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband. And, and in that saidest thou truly. So you spoke the truth. You did have five husbands at one time. Now, the Bible doesn't say what happened to them. They could have passed away or whatever or put her away. Um, the Bible is not clear on that. But the person that she was with was not her husband. And look how she replies to what he said to her. Verse 19. The woman said unto him, sir, one more time, I perceive thou art a, a prophet. While I was, I was studying this, I got excited. Yeah. So he went from a Jew yeah. Yeah. and her expectations yeah. of what the Jews represented to the Samaritans to call him sir, yeah, sir. and call him sir up quite a few times. But then he comes to this place after he reveals that he spoke something into her that she, he, he, there's no way he could have known. Mm -hmm. She didn't know him from a can of paint. But she said, sir, I perceive you to be a prophet. Mm. Now, we understand, you know, as, as the scriptures have proclaimed in, in society and all around the world, if an individual is called a prophet, that means that they prophesy. Mm -hmm. Or they t talk of things to, that are to come. Or they, you know, said certain things that align with what the word of God says. Amen? All right. There are people who honor prophets today, but that doesn't mean they know God. I know individuals who are Muslim who call people prophets. They don't know the God that I'm, I'm talking about. There are people who proclaim Jesus to be a prophet and don't believe his teachings. If you claim to be a prophet, what you prophesy has to come to pass in every detail, according to scripture. And if you call Jesus a prophet, what did he prophesy? What did he say regarding himself and the father's will? Jesus proclaimed to be the son of God. The only begotten, born of a virgin, died and crucified on a cross, and was risen on the third day with all power in his hand. That's the Jesus that I serve. That's the prophet, and he's not just a prophet. He's the king and the high priest. He is everything that we need wrapped up in one. He is the God incarnate. He is the God-man. Son of the living God. The only name whereby man must be saved. Jesus Christ. The only begotten of the Father. So, I respect it if you call him a prophet. But he's much, much more. I know Denzel Washington. When I see his picture, I recognize him. I've seen his movies. Have any of you? Yeah. If you saw him in the street, you would say, that's Denzel Washington. Am I right or am I wrong? But just because you can identify the man doesn't mean you know the man. Just because you come to church doesn't mean you know the man. We're talking about relationship here. 
The woman said, I perceive, I'm seeing that you are a prophet because you've just prophesied something that wasn't revealed to you. There's no way you could have known that. But what I want you to understand, my brothers and sisters, today is just because she proclaimed and identified the fact that he prophesied something that was true, it still didn't mean that she knew him for herself. It's a relationship. Relationship. All right. 19, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Verse 20, our fathers. Now she's starting, you're starting to see the shift. She says, our fathers. Speaking of the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She's starting to associate, listen, you as a Jew, me as a Samaritan, we have some common out. She's starting to bridge the gap. You follow me? She's starting to see, let's make this connection. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. Now follow me here. Worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So what she's saying it here is, our fathers, they, you know, they worshiped in this mountain. But a sect of the Jews are saying that there's only one location where you ought to worship. So she's saying to him, listen, we, we have a commonality. We have a foundation here. But, but there, there seems to be somewhat of a disconnect here because you're saying, you're saying, that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. I'm not in Jerusalem. I'm not welcome in Jerusalem. Have you ever gone to a place of worship and not felt welcome? In the house of God? can that be? Have you made someone feel unwelcome in the house of God? Hide your toes. I'm talking real. Come on now. Stop. You, 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 we got to stop it with the games. Stop playing around and be real. Be real. We've done a lot of damage in the name of Jesus. We've done a lot of damage. she expresses something that's real, a, a problem, an identity problem. And she's saying, hey, prophet, we have the same lineage, but there's a disconnect in our worship. Look what Jesus says to her in verse 21. Je Jesus saith unto her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. There's going to come a time where you're not going to be able to worship here or there. But following verse 22, ye worship, ye know not what. I'm going to come back to that. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Now, this is heavy. Jesus says to her, ye worship and ye know not what. <laughs> you on point, sis. You worship and you don't know what you're worshiping. Jesus is identifying the fact for her that there is a disconnect in her connection with the Heavenly Father. You're worshiping, but you're going through the ritual. You're just doing it out of tradition. What you're offering is what you've been taught to do. But you really don't have a legitimate connection to the Father. So, so Jesus starts off saying, listen, there's, there's going to come a time where you're not going to be able to worship here or there. But you don't know what you're worshiping. 
You, you don't have the knowledge, the, the fullness of knowledge, okay? And this is where, why he says, we know what we worship. Speaking of us as Jewish people, we know that God created the heavens and earth. You know, the father, you know, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We know who he is, but we don't know him personally because salvation is of the Jews. It's, it, the, the, the law of God was going to come through the Jewish people and the savior of us all was going to be a Jew. But you don't know him yet. Your relationship matters. Verse 23. But the hour cometh and now is. So the, the, the hour is coming. It's, it's now. It's nigh. When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Notice he says the true worshipers. So if there's true worshipers been by cause and effect or, or, or you know, this or that, it, there has to be false worshipers. So being a false worshiper, what would that look like? Well, I guess it could look like somebody who comes to church, but it's not really connected. Or someone who goes to prayer meeting, but it's not really engaged. They're saying the word, the, as the scripture says, you know, with their mouths they honor me, but their hearts are far from me. That's what God says about some of us who have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. We, ha we look the part, we, we dress up nice, we, we show up on time, we, we jump through all the hoops, we go through all the classes, and there's still no connection. My God. God desires obedience more than your sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of our lifestyle to follow after God's principles. Our flesh says, stay in the bed a little bit longer. But the spirit says, get up and be on time to honor and serve me you're not doing it for man you're doing it as unto the Lord please people don't confuse your service with relationship with God your service is good and needed without a doubt but never forget to be at the master's feet it's about relationship how many of you pay bills yeah oh man oh man <laughs> not everybody pays bills my lord wait, wait. i want that life <laughs> well think about this my cell phone bill. I pay my cell phone bill. If I don't, you know what happens. But I pay it faithfully. But guess what? Just because I pay my phone bill faithfully doesn't mean I know them or work for them. So just because you come to church, play the drums, beat on the organ, or play the saxophone doesn't mean you know him. Relationship over ritual. Verse 23. True worshipers. True worshipers. What do true worshipers look like? True worshipers. Doesn't mean you have to do backflips down the aisle. Doesn't mean you have to, you know, do anything uh, that anybody says but honoring God, period. Shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In the spirit of God, being filled with his spirit, and in truth, 
the scripture proclaims that truth is a person. When Jesus was asked, you know, how can we go where you're going? He says, I am the way. The what? The truth and the light. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus, the same word that's used here for truth, is the same word Jesus used when he said, I am the truth. So if you want to know what the truth is, you can't separate that from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the truth. So we have to worship him in spirit, having a Holy Ghost connection with the Heavenly Father because the Holy Spirit has been given to all of us who name the name of Christ and have confessed him in our hearts. We have been indwelled with the Holy Spirit of God and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. The Father seeks. The Father is looking For these types of individuals to worship him. And how many of you think that if God is looking for something, he won't be able to find it? I'll wait. There's nothing that God is not aware of. Came to seek and to save those or that which were lost. And the truth was we were all lost. But God, hallelujah, the father is seeking those types of individuals to worship him. And if he's searching, he's going to find verse 24. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So you must have the Holy Spirit. You must be seeing as the scripture says, we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, a promise until the day of redemption. So. If you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, God is going to return for his investment. Yes, My God. In spirit and in truth, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Verse 25. And the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he comes is come, he will teach us all things. Now, my Lord, she went from, she, come on, one step closer. Come on, sister, you right with me. He went from being a what? A Jew. Then he went to being, sir. Then he went to being prophet. And now she's talking about who? The Messiah. Little bit here, little bit more, little bit to the left. <laughs> Hallelujah! She went to the well just to get some water for the day and she found the Messiah. Hey! <laughs> my God, my God, my God. Hallelujah! Woo! I know. She didn't say, I think. She didn't say that, you know what, maybe she said, I know. She was making a confession about something that she knows will come to pass. But still at this point, he is still merely a prophet to her. Understand, there had to go a transition from becoming more than just somebody who knew something that he had no business knowing. Amen? She said, I know know that Messiah come. Now understand this, prior to the New Testament scriptures when Jesus came on the scene and and started his ministry, all of the Old Testament prophets for all the way from the beginning, all the way to the New Testament were waiting for the appearance of the Messiah, the promised one of God who would redeem and turn and bring the kingdom to to a fruition they were all waiting for this to happen so they were all rightfully waiting but Jesus was revealing to this woman in this chance encounter on his behalf that he he was trying to get her to understand listen there's something spiritual I need you to understand it's more than just your traditions it's more than what you've been told by your parents it's more than what you're just going through on a regular
regular basis. It's more than your religion that you've been following through on. It's more than your grandmama praying for you. It's more than your papa praying for you. It's going to be more significant what I want to reveal to you. Flesh and blood can't give this to you, but only my heavenly father in heaven who can reveal this to you. You're no longer just waiting on a random promise that you heard from old. He wants to make it real to you. Your relationship matters to me. Your ritual means nothing if there's no connection. If you want to truly serve me, serve me from the heart. Start there and out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Do I have a witness? True worshipers, true worshipers, true worshipers, true worshipers. You're heading to church. You know you have a responsibility at church. You're getting, getting ready to walk out your door and your neighbor approaches you and says, listen, my babies are hungry right now. Do you have anything that you can give so I can just give my baby something to eat? True worshipers would understand and hear this, 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 this spiritual matter and, and say, listen, the church can wait. The program can wait. This needs to be done. God is telling me to minister in this moment. True worshipers are a willing to sacrifice of themselves. And we don't like that. That's the truth. We don't mind helping out. As long as it doesn't really cost us anything. Am, am I making this up? You see, I mean, if I say, can I, can I say, can I borrow five dollars and you got a thousand dollars in your pocket, that doesn't hurt you. But if I say I need, you know, nine hundred and ninety nine dollars, then it's another story. It's a little bit closer to home. Now, I'm just using that as an example. I'm not saying that you have to do that. I mean, if you want to give me some money, I'll take it, but I'm just like, <laughs> no. But the point I'm trying to make is, it's not always comfortable to do the right thing. But if we're really connected to our Heavenly Father, we'll do those things. And not feeling that we're justified in the eyes of God just because I serve at my church. Oh, I paid my dues. I went to church for the week. So all week long, I could tell people off on my job because on Sunday, I'm going to church. Come on. We live like hell all week long and feel we're okay just because we came to church, said a prayer, and got up and went on our way. And God is saying, I don't know you. Who, who are you? Your relationship matters. It matters. So she says in verse 25, I know that Messiah comes. Which is called Christ. Messiah and Christ are the same word. Just Christ is the Greek equivalent to Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. But she says, I know that he's coming. I long for the Messiah. And all that he will bring. And what does Jesus proclaim to her in verse 26? Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. She had a drop your bucket moment. Hold your horses, clutch the pearls. What? 
She lost her mind. Yeah, yeah. Jesus revealed all of this to her. Now, we know as a result of this, and you can read on in your own time, as a result of this, the whole area where she lived that turned the whole city upside down, her testimony of this encounter with the people of her village turned everybody around. They said, what in the world? I don't know what happened to Sister Marsha, but whatever it is, I want it. Whatever she got, I want it. Take me to where you met this man. All she said is, come see a man who told me all my business. Hallelujah. And the people said, you know what? We heard it from Sister Girl. But now we know for ourselves who he is. It went from being a tradition and a, a ritual and a routine to being real. Having a relationship and not a routine. Sisters and brothers, please hear me. Hear me when I say, please make sure. As Brother Davis said earlier, make sure your calling and election is sure, yeah, yeah. whatever it may be. Make sure you have a legitimate connection to God and not just a superficial one with works and deeds. Now, if you have a legitimate relationship with the Heavenly Father, it will produce out of you works and and deeds but we are not put in a better place with him because of what we do now why do you say that brother minister I'll tell you why look at Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 the scripture says not everyone that saith unto me Lord Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven who wow. hit the pause button but he what's it say but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Yeah. Selah. Jesus said, in that day, what is that day? That day of judgment. Mm -hmm. Each and every one of us will have a day of judgment. Yeah. We will all stand before him and give an account for every single thing we have ever done in our life. Now, there is a difference between judgments. In scripture, we know is one is the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ, which is a judgment for believers. Okay, so if you believe in Jesus Christ, when we stand before him, we will have to give an account for what we've done. Okay, and that includes things good and bad. Okay, but when we're talking about the bad, it's not a judgment in us losing our salvation. It's bad in meaning we wasted a whole bunch of time on stuff that didn't really benefit the kingdom of God. All right. And then there's another judgment called the great white throne judgment. Right. That's at the very end. And that's primarily for the wicked. Ooh. All right. Now it says that whoever's name was not found in the Lamb's book of life uh -oh. or in the book of life, uh, you know, those individuals would be cast into the lake of fire for eternity. Now it says whose ever name was not found. So it's a possibility during that time that, you know, maybe somebody could make it in. Now, now there's differences of opinion on that. However, I like to believe what God's word is true and it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. But focus on what he says here. Jesus is saying this. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. Verse 22. This is Matthew 7, 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, follow this. Have we not prophesied in thy name? Mm. Look out, prophesied in pre preaching the gospel? These are the same individuals that are saying, Lord, Lord. And he's saying, 
they're not entering in. Follow me closely. Yeah. Didn't we prophesy in your name? And in thy name has cast out devils? What? <laughs> and in thy name done many wonderful works? These individuals are standing before God, and God is saying, no, nah, you can't come in. You're not coming into the kingdom. And their immediate response, now follow me, their immediate response is, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> come on, yeah. That's right, son. Didn't I <laughs> prophesy? In your name, mm -hmm. and in thy name cast out devils, mm -hmm. and in thy name done many wonderful works. Mm -hmm. So God is saying, uh-uh, no, you, you can't come in. And their immediate response is, look, you owe me. <laughs> That's not funny. That ain't funny. Think about it. Th th he, listen to me. Listen, whenever I preach, I, 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 my, I'm attempting to engage your mind. I want you to really think about what we're, what we're doing here. God gave us intellect. God gave us a mind to think and to understand. And a lot of us have walked around in a fog not really understanding what God is trying to say. It's not that deep in some cases. God's word is deep. But he made it real simple that even a baby could understand it. But follow. God is saying, no, you can't come in. And they are saying, hold up. I did this and that in an effort to work myself in. What they were trying to say was, God, I've worked hard enough to be ushered in or enter in. They never said because of Jesus shed blood. They never said because you said I'm your child. They said I did this and I did that. So if I did this and did that, that means you have to compensate me for what I've done. It went from being a relationship to being a transaction. My brothers and sisters, please understand, the gift of God is simply that. It's a gift. It, it's no longer a gift. It becomes a reward if you did something to warrant it. You go to work, you get paid. That's called compensation. A gift is strictly that. You didn't do anything to earn it. It was just given to you. The gift of salvation has been given to us by the grace of God through faith. Hallelujah. But the individuals in this text, they didn't try to stand on the promise of God. They didn't try to lean on their faith in believing that salvation was of God. They believed that salvation was based on their performance. Or else they would have said something else. But they tried to justify themselves in the face of God by what they did in his name. They did it in his name, but he didn't know them. Your relationship matters. Now, the things that they did, understand this, were legitimate things. And it's quite possible that people were saved and delivered by what they were doing. And you say, how could that happen? Because the word of God has power by itself. It's God's word. My brother Bell and, and, and Minister Shields were talking about the word of God and how there's power in the word of God. In spite of me, I stand on the word of God. That's our foundation. We can't lay anything else on top of it but what's already been laid. The word of God is sure. So even someone who, who didn't know 
God for themselves, if they were to get up here on a microphone and read from the word that Jesus saves, yeah, yeah. if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, if they read those words and people hear it and the seed is planted, someone could be saved. And that person couldn't know the Lord from anybody. There's power in God's word. But don't miss the point. These individuals were self-deceived by the routine, by the traditions of men. And they felt and mistook that for a relationship. Relationship over ritual. Ritual's important. And please understand what I'm saying. Everything we do is important. It has significance. But it can never replace the true fellowship with our Heavenly Father. Verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew. He said, I, I never knew you. There wasn't. There wasn't a point where I did know you and you were in fellowship and then you fell off. I never knew you. So they got caught up in the, tr to tr the routine of things and the, the isms and the, the, the faculties of, of doing and facilitating ministry, but never had the minister. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and do them, it's Jesus talking. I will liken him unto a wise man which buildeth his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and blew and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell not for it was founded upon the rock. And in closing, John chapter 15, verse 4. These are the words of Jesus. Abide in me. Now, he didn't stop there. He didn't say abide in me as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself. He didn't say that. But he said abide in me and what? And I in you. There's a relationship. It's not one-sided. It's not one-sided. So you could be working for the Lord. I've been running for Jesus a long time. And Jesus is saying, who's that? Look out, sir. Who's, that who's that crazy person running? Yeah. <laughs> Don't be that person. Abide in me. If you read through that passage in John chapter 15, Jesus is talking about a, a, dual, a dual relationship. And it, it, look, how many of you ever been in a relationship and it was one-sided? It seemed like you were the only person invested. You know, it seemed like you were the only person, you know, calling and, and chasing. And, and only to find out, you say, you know what, what am I doing? And then you stop calling and that person never calls you back. You say, well, I guess, you know. But there's a relationship. God wants a relationship over your service. Mary and Martha. Martha was working for Jesus. Is there something wrong? Is there, is there anything wrong with working for Jesus? Oh, no, no, no. Not at all. Amen. But sacrifice is just that. It means a relinquishing of our will, our, op our opinions, our feelings, just to say, God, help me to be better for you. I know I ain't right. How many of you can admit that you got some issues you need to work on? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's all of us. Come on. So why do we act like we got it all together? Just because I showed up on time. Just because I checked off all the boxes. 
And God is saying, that ain't it, baby. Come to God with a sacrifice that only you can give. It's a sacrifice for us to say, Lord, only you can change my attitude. If that's your problem. Lord, only you can deliver me from that spirit of lust. Only you can deal with that spirit of homosexuality. Only you can help me and not be judgmental of people because you don't know what people are going through. And quite frankly, it's none of your business. It's between them and God. So just as God has showed you and I mercy, we ought to have love and mercy towards everyone else. And I don't care what your issue is. If someone comes to me and says, listen, I'm struggling with X, Y, and Z, I say, okay, well, there's a prayer that can help you with that. I can pray with you. God is able. I don't look down on nobody, no matter what the situation is that they're going through. Be it drug addiction, whatever. All right, let's get it. Let's pray. Let's do it. God is able. I've seen him do it. We can't, yeah, hey, come on now. If he did it for you, he could do it for someone else. Your relationship, don't miss it. Don't miss it, sisters and brothers. Your relationship to God matters, not your service. The service is good and it's important. We need you. We need help in the ministry. Amen. Deacon Turner, he agrees. We need help. More hands. But beyond all of that, and before all of that, you got to get your heart right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Bow your heads. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you today. Lord, we, we know by birth and by your divine plan, you sent your son, Jesus, who, yes, indeed, was a Jew. And Lord, we also came to find out and came to understand that he was to be respected as a sir. And Lord, yes, we also understand and have come to understand that he also is a prophet. But Lord, we thank you for much, much more for the understanding that he is the Messiah, the son of the living God, the only one whereby we must be saved. And Father, today, we thank you that we can call him Jesus, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, the savior and redeemer of our soul. Father, you said in your word that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, Father, we thank you that we know you for who you are. And, Lord, we also pray that you would just continually draw us closer to you. We don't want to just serve you through routine or, or ritual or tradition. But, Lord, we want to serve you out of a sincere heart out of a relationship we know you in the pardon of our sins we know you as the savior of our soul we know you personally so father we thank you today in jesus name we pray amen now if there's someone here today who knows that you haven't turned your life over to the lord we want to make sure that you can get that right today. And it simply begins with a confession from your mouth and your heart that Jesus came to be the savior of your soul. He's the only one who could die and take the punishment that you and I deserved because he was perfect. He did not sin. But he said, you know what? In spite of anything that you've ever done, I'm willing to take this, the punishment that you deserve so you don't have to so you can have everlasting life if you're here today 
and you know you've never done that, and you want to be connected to the Heavenly Father, just raise your hand right where you are, and I'll pray with you so we can make sure that that's set today. Is there one? thank God. I just want to say uh, for all of you who are here and if what you're saying is that you know the Lord in the pardon of your sins, take heed to what was shared today and make sure you're serving God out of a place of, re of a legitimate relationship. We don't serve him or honor him as a set of rules, but we serve and honor him as a way of appreciation for what he's done for us. We want to obey him because we love him. Anyone you love, you don't intentionally hurt, do you? Anyone you love, you want to do right by them. So that's why we love, we honor him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments I don't know about you but that's one of the most challenging verses in all of scripture for me I'm quick to say Lord I love you but Jesus said if you do qualify that love by doing what I said and I'm like ooh really he said yeah that's alright amen God bless you Let's give the Lord a hand clap. See, I told you this preacher, he was what? Electrifying. He'll carry you down deep and he'll bring you up with just the simple truths. Isn't that right? Just the simple truth of relationship matters. He's one of those preachers that he lets his light so shine. Not just among us, he's the kind of preacher who lets his light shine in his home, in his neighborhood. And that's what it's all about. He's just such a uh, electrifying preacher. And I'm so glad. And we ought to be so glad yeah, yeah. to have such a preacher among us. Amen. 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 That stands and proclaims God's word. Yeah. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Relationship. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's what giving is all about. I said, that's what giving is all about. It's just about relationship. You know, every time I give my gifts, it's not to the church. They ask for it. But I don't, I don't give this gift to the church. Because they always want more. I give this gift to the Lord. Because I can never outbeat his giving. I give this gift. What, what, what am I trying to say? That whatever you have, give it to the Lord. And let the Lord give that to the church. Because he can do with it what we cannot do. And so as we prepare ourselves for our gifts and giving, we have our trustees to come. And then after they come, we we'll, uh, ask our great preacher, Reverend Adam Parker, to come back and to give us.
closing remarks in our benediction. Again, let's give the Lord a hand clap.